we're going to be getting into a brand new sermon series, actually, that we're just going to be starting today. Actually, we're, we're hitting Easter a little bit later than what normally churches do, but we've got actually, what is it, two, three weeks till Easter? Uh, I mean, this is a three-week series, so <laughs> it's coming out quick. Easter is very early in the, in the calendar year. Uh, this year, and uh, we're really looking forward to it. I, th- I think at the end of the service, Wayne's going to be sharing about our plans for Easter, um, but uh, we, we've got some exciting services planned here at the church for that. But I wanted to just take this time as we look into God's Word uh, over the next three weeks to really focus on uh, exactly what my title is, the, the process that, that led Jesus into his crucifixion on the cross, his death, we're going to focus on, and then culminating Easter Sunday with talking about his resurrection and uh, the life and the the hope that we have because of it. So I'm glad that uh, you're here this morning and that we can look into God's word. Our text is Matthew chapter 26 verses 17 through 30 and uh, if you have your Bibles I want you to open there because we are going to be spending uh, the whole time this morning right in this text And uh, we are actually going to be talking about the Last Supper. Now, the Last Supper took place uh, during during the time of of Passover. Uh, Jesus and his disciples met together, and we'll talk about that. But what we're doing today is we're actually going to be celebrating communion. And uh, communion is a very meaningful thing that we do as a church. We, we chose to do it once a month. It doesn't matter how often you do it. It says whenever you do it, do it in remembrance of Christ, his death, in remembrance of his body and his blood. And so uh, we are going to be going through this, this passage in Matthew 20, 26 this morning and, and learning things that we can draw out from this passage that apply to our celebration of communion, oh, what it means how we need to prepare ourselves for it. And so uh, this event took place uh, before Jesus' crucifixion, and uh, we'll we'll be talking about that this morning. There are a lot of artists that have taken the words of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They all talk about this passage that we're going to be in this morning. And they've they've taken their paintbrushes, and they've painted great magnificent paintings of the last supper you can probably recall some of them a huge long table the disciples looking over to jesus jesus holding a cup or something like that and what you see is some sometimes these these artists took the interpretation that this was a very happy a festive time and so they they painted it with the disciples with smiles on their face uh just like they they were just like celebrating this time with jesus and other disciples, they, they took it and, and they, they painted the faces of, of the disciples and Jesus very somber. Uh, like, this was a, like this was a sad time, like something very serious was happening. And uh, it's just interesting as you look at artists' interpretation of, of scripture, of what happened, they come up with different perspectives. And that is the way that Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John also approached the Last Supper, is they approached it from their own unique perspective. Maybe they were sitting in a different location uh, during, during the time when Jesus shared these things. And so they all have the same story, but different ways of telling it. And uh, that, is, that is what we see as we look at Matthew chapter 26. We are going to be actually looking at the Last Supper from the eyes of Matthew, the author, obviously inspired of the Holy Spirit, but written from his perspective. And so uh, why don't, as we begin, we will open up our Bibles to, if you haven't gotten there already, Matthew 26. And remember, we are looking to observe this passage to apply it to how we celebrate the Lord's Supper, the Lord's table, our, our remembrance of his body, his bloodshed for us. And so we're going to be looking at four different observances that we can apply this morning, as we take partake of the Lord's Supper, first thing I want you to notice is this. If you're taking notes, it's preparation. The preparation that went into it. We are uh, going to start in verse 17 and read through verse 18 uh, with this first point here. And so if you have your Bibles, uh, why don't you just follow along with me? It says, now on the first day of unleavened bread... The disciples came to Jesus saying, where will you have us prepare for you to eat the Passover? 
he said, Go into the city to a certain man and say to him, The teacher says, My time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at your house with my disciples. Let's stop there. So it was the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the way that they opened that was celebrating the Passover. Now, the Passover was, was something that started way back in Egypt. You remember when God delivered the Israelites out of, out of the hand of Pharaoh, sending the ten plagues, and then the last one was the death of the firstborn. God said to them, you, you, you go and, and, and put blood on, on your doorposts, okay? Take, take a lamb, an un, unblemished lamb, Kill it, offer it, eat it, and then and, and, and make sure that, that you're preparing it in haste. Get packed up, get ready to go, because God is going to deliver you out of Egypt. And so this Passover meal was, was a recognition of how when the angel of death came in, that all those that had the blood of the lamb on their doorposts were passed over. And, and that is what they were celebrating. It was the, the first part of the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And so there were really these two feasts that were combined. And there was a lot of preparation that went into observing these feasts. And so you see right off the bat in verse 17 that these disciples are inquiring of Jesus, where are we going to prepare for you to celebrate the Passover? Now this, this Passover meal was some, something that was celebrated with families. Now, were these disciples in Jesus' family? No, they weren't. But they had become family by their close relationship with each other uh, because they had left their own families to follow Jesus. And so naturally, this was the family that Jesus had chosen, uh, the twelve. And so Jesus goes on, and, and as they're inquiring of of where this is going to be, Jesus tells them of a certain man that is going to be in the city, that they're, they're going to inform him that his time is at hand. And according to other gospels, Jesus identified this man as a man that would be carrying a water pitcher. Now, how he knew that, we don't know. He's God. He knows everything. And so he knew that this man, at the time the, the, the disciples would approach him, he'd be carrying a water pitcher. And they were to tell him that his time was at hand, that they were coming, that they were coming to celebrate the Passover in his home. And so this was probably a man that Jesus had made previous arrangements with, or, or maybe by, by being God, he just put it in his heart to know that his time would be, be at hand. And so as we move on to verse 19, we see the further preparations. It says, and the disciples did as Jesus had directed them, and the, they prepared the Passover. Much preparation went into preparing a Passover meal. I don't know if you've ever uh, partaken of a, a Seder dinner before. Uh, these are things that are, are practiced in, in some churches where they bring in someone that, that knew all about the, the preparations that went into celebrating the Passover dinner. And uh, and, and they bring those, those authentic items into that place, and, uh, and they do it just like the Jews would have done. It's very, very interesting. If you ever have a chance to attend a Seder dinner, please do it, uh, because this is, it gives you an idea of all the preparations that went in. There are very specific things that they had to do. Uh, they had to bring in unleavened bread, certain spices, fruit. They had to bring a lamb. So there's a lot of preparation that went in. Even when they, they came into this borrowed room, what they had to do is they had to search through the whole room for any bread, okay? Because every speck of leavened, uh, unleavened bread had to be taken out. I, I, leavened bread, actually. The, anything that had yeast in it, they were to search for and take out of that room because yeast represented the evil influence of Egypt. And also, now was rec recognized as the influence of sin. Uh, scripture talks about a little bit of leavening, leaven, leavening the whole, whole lump of dough. Uh, how, how a little bit of sin within, within a church can, can destroy it. That's what they were to search for and remove physically. It was a, it was a picture of sin, the influence of sin. So there was a lot of preparation that went into this meal, a whole lot that I can even describe, because 
We just don't know their culture and know, don't know all their customs. But to apply this to ourselves, what, what I see is just as the disciples had to prepare for the Lord's Supper, we must also prepare to partake of this Lord's Supper as we take the body and the blood of our Lord. We are told by Paul that we need to prepare ourselves, aren't we? We are. According to Paul, we're to observe the Lord's Supper with a prepared heart. Paul says we are not to observe the Lord's Supper in an unworthy manner. We are to look at ourselves and come to the table with our hearts prepared. That's each one of us. Start doing that. Start preparing your heart to receive this supper. Along with that preparation, I I believe comes self-examination. I I had a passage up there if you didn't have your Bibles. (laughs) We'll skip through it. Self-examination. We see this in verses 20 through 25, and and it really carries on from this idea of preparation is, is how, how do we do it? It's by looking at ourselves, self-examination. We see this example in the disciples as well. We'll start in verse 20. It says that when it was evening, he reclined at the table with the twelve. And as they were eating, he said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him one after another, Is it I, Lord? He answered, He who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not have been born. Judas, who would betray him, answered, Is it I, Rabbi? He said to him, You have said so. Now Jesus interrupts this meal with a very startling statement. He says, One of you will betray me. One of you is going to give me up. Now, the disciples already knew that that he was going to be crucified that he would be delivered up but they weren't told yet that it would would be one of them and so when faced with this news they were distressed actually the the greek words uh, indicate that they were deeply sorrowful that they were violently shaken by the news and each one of them questioned their own genuineness asking is it i lord is it i Is it I, Jesus, Lord, Master, is it, is it me? And so they question themselves. And oftentimes, uh, even though Jesus Jesus knew who would betray him, he allowed these questions to come up, didn't he? And these things, these questions can, can be helpful for us as long as they point our focus back toward Christ and his sufficiency. We need to examine ourselves. We need to question the genuineness of our own faith. Lord, is it I? Am I guilty of this? Lord, what is, what is in me that is not honoring to you? And often when we do that, the Holy Spirit brings those things to mind that we need to repent of, that we need to take action, physical action with. Not just repent to God, but but confess to others. Self-examination. Well, as as we move on in in looking at at these verses that we just read, we see also Jesus' address to Judas. And I believe that in this scene we see the graciousness of God as he appeals to Judas like like a family member in love. Okay? Now, did did Jesus know that Judas was going to betray him? Absolutely, he did. But he approached him in love. Now, as as I said, this Passover meal, it was observed by families. These disciples were a family together. They had become a family with Christ. Each one had dipped their hand in the bowl, just just as they observed this feast. And the psalmist, it describes in Psalm 41, you don't have to turn there, I'm going to read it 
but it, it gives us a messianic prophecy telling us about this moment, saying this. I think I have it up on the screen. David, he's prophesying about Christ as he's saying, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. Very descriptive as to what Judas was going to do. And as Jesus continues speaking, he speaks about the consequences, warning of, of the action, saying, Woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better, it would have been good for that man if he would not have been born. He's warning Judas of the consequences of what he's about to do, of his lack of true relationship, that it would result in a fate that was so bad that it would be good if he had never existed in the first place than to face such a fate. He was warning. And finally, there's a direct indication of Judas by Christ. As Judas asks the question, Rabbi, is it I? Christ responds, you have said so. Now, you may not have thought of this before, but... In Judas's question, it reveals the problem with his faith. Each one of those disciples asks, asks, is it I, Lord? What did Judas ask? He asked, Rabbi, is it I, teacher? You see the problem? Judas didn't recognize Christ as Lord. And so rather than call him Lord, he calls him teacher. And it, in that, it reveals his lack of faith. He didn't see Jesus as his Lord. Application from this, as we, as we look at this self-examination, we need to examine our own hearts as we approach this table. Jesus, by his statement, caused each one of the disciples to examine their own hearts, to see the, the frailty of their own faith. And examine the nature of their commitment to him. We need to do the same. As we approach the communion table, we are told that we ought to examine ourselves. Classic passages in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, which speaks to what we ought to be doing as we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper. It says, let each person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. That's serious. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. Paul says, let each person examine themselves. Examine yourself on the nature of your commitment to him. What is in your life right now that is not honoring to God that you need to confess? We're not to enter lightly into the observance of the Lord's Supper. So there's preparation. There is self-examination. Third, I see the representation. And Christ makes that very clear. As you'll see, Jesus, Jesus he, he demonstrated his willingness to allow even the worst of sinners to receive forgiveness in him. And we see that as he speaks of the representation of his, his body and his blood. We're in verses 26 through 28, where it, says, where it says this. Now as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took a cup when he had given thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink it all of you for this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So again, Jesus, he's interrupting the Passover meal. And this time he interrupts it in order to transform this Passover dinner into the Lord's supper. 
And that's what Jesus was doing. He takes the bread. He tells his disciples that this bread now represents my body. The thing that you use to, to think about your deliverance from Egypt. Now this represents my flesh, my body. My body, the life that I have lived, it's being offered that you might live. And then he takes this cup. He says, says take it and, and drink it, all of you. He says, this wine now represents my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Some of your translations have the word remission. That is a great word if you have it in, in, your, in your Bibles. That word remission means release. The shedding of Jesus' blood on the cross was so that many might experience release from the penalty of sin. His bleeding, dying blood purchased our forgiveness. So the disciples were to take or to receive the bread, which represented the body of Christ, the wine, which represented the blood of Christ. And these were representations and reminders of the truth that we may have life, forgiveness, and release from the power of sin and its dominion over us, taking by faith Christ's life, his blood, his righteousness on our behalf. That is the representation, his body, his blood. So there's preparation, self-examination, that we should all be doing right now as we prepare to receive the Lord's Supper. And also that re remembrance of the representation of Christ. The fourth, and finally, we see in verses 29 and 30, the anticipation that he left the disciples with. In verse 29, he says, I tell you, I will not drink again of this fruit of the vine until the day I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. According to Jesus, this meal would be observed again when he was with his disciples again in his Father's kingdom. The fellowship would continue. What was Jesus implying? Resurrection. He was not going to the cross just to die. No, there was hope. They would see him again in his father's kingdom. And because he would be resurrected, we have that hope and anticipation. So shall we. So shall we. So we observe the Lord's Supper, preparing our hearts, examining ourselves, Reminding ourselves of his body and his blood. And lastly, we are anticipating his coming. That day when we will fellowship with him again, where he will return as a bridegroom for his bride. He will take us home to be with him. That we will fellowship with him forever. Are you living in anticipation for that day? Is that you? Pray that that is our hearts as we approach this table so we approach the lord's supper let us be doing each of these things preparing examining remembering and anticipating let me pray for us god we are thankful that your word is a lamp unto our feet a guide to our path lord and as we approach this table we want to honor your blood your body that was poured out for us and so we rejoice in the fact that, that this gives us hope. Lord, as, as we spend these couple moments in silence before we go to this table, God, I, I pray that, Lord, you would help us to prepare our hearts, to examine ourselves, to remember your body and your blood. And Lord, not to forget that you have risen and that we await your return. We anticipate it, God. We love you. Lord, use these moments as we spend doing this to change us. Let's spend a couple moments in silence as we do this.
God, we confess these things to you. And we thank you for your blood, your body. We thank you that you have resurrected, Lord, and that you are resurrecting us. Lord, as we partake of this, help us to honor you. In Jesus' name.